And hello, everybody. Like Bob said, my name is Laura Nickerson. I'm an application engineer with Computer Aided Technology. I'm based in Massachusetts. So today I'm going to show you master modeling techniques, something I used a lot in my previous life as an industrial and mechanical designer. So now as we look at these products, notice that they're very form driven and generally they're more organic or sculptural in shape. There are multiple parts that share the same overall form or they can have common dimensions. Individual components can have their specific functions, but they can also offer different surface treatments and textures. And it would be very repetitive and time consuming to model each component as an individual entity. So in some applications, we want to design the final product first and then separate out the individual parts. This technique is widely used in consumer or medical product design. So here's what we'll be designing. It's some sort of a handheld device and it will consist of a front and back housing, a two piece cover and a keypad. So this will employ master modeling techniques, hybrid modeling techniques, which combines both solid and surface modeling. And we'll be creating a multi-body part as our master model. For the master model, we can start with a set of surfaces or we can start with any form, be it organic or a prismatic shape. This technique works for all. So this is what we're going to be doing today in our demo. We're going to be looking, we're going to be designing the overall form. We're going to break it up into separate bodies. We're going to add specific features to the individual bodies. And then we will verify the design. And this will be our master model. And then we'll save those bodies out as individual components and create an assembly. We'll make changes to our design. So the beauty of the master model technique is that we create a parent-child relationship between the master model and the individual child components. Any changes made to the master will propagate to the child components and this will speed up our design process. Because of that parent-child relationship, it's best to use the master model technique on your one-of-a-kind type models on a unique design. It is not conducive to your standard parts library. <clears throat> so the first step is to generate the overall form. It can start from scratch, it can start with hand-drawn sketches, or it can be mesh data generated from a 3D scanned model. So today we'll begin our product design using the hand-drawn sketches to generate the overall form. We'll define some curves and then we'll use the curves to build a solid model. And then we'll create an extruded surface to remove unwanted material. So let's go ahead and jump into SolidWorks. So I have my hand-drawn sketch imported and sized appropriately as a sketch picture. So the first thing we're going to do is create a sketch that basically tra traces over the outer contour of our sketch picture. And I'm using a spline to do this. All right, splines are a great way to create organic curves. All right. And now we can adjust our spline using the spline handles, or we can, oh, excuse me, or we can um, add relations to our spline. This guy will have a vertical relation. Oh, my mouse is going nuts on me. There we go. WebEx is going nuts. Come on. There we go, vertical relation. Sorry about that. And we can still adjust them. So this looks good. I'm happy with that. Now it's OK to leave your splines underdefined. Right. I'm going to add one more relation. That's going to be a horizontal relation between the uh, bottom spline point and my, my uh, origin. Make that horizontal. Looks good. So if you do require fully defined sketches, you can uh, adjust or you can dimension each one of these spline points. All right, I'll accept that. 
All right, so I already have a right side sketch picture inserted and sized appropriately, and I already have a right side uh, spline sketched. So I'm just going to edit the spline, and I'll make sure that these two splines are the same height. And I have my horizontal relationship, so I'm good. Okay. So these are going to be guide curves in our sweep feature. Now the path of our sweep will just be a vertical line. And I'll make sure that this guy is the same height as my guide curves. Now the profile of, the, of our sweep is going to be an ellipse. Now it's best practice when you're creating sweeps to sketch in your path and your guide curves first and that way you can relate the profile back to these entities so I'll have a coincident relationship with the endpoint of my path and now my major and minor axis points are going to have a Pierce relationship with the guide curves Right. These Pierce relationship ensures that this point is always going to ride along the curve and that my profile is going to resize with these curves. This looks good. So now I always ask my, um, my essential students to rename their path and their profile from the tree. Right. I'm ask, I ask them to do this for two reasons. Number one, when you come back to your model, you know, two months later, you know what these sketches are used for. And secondly, when you go into the sweep command, you can now just pick right from the tree these entities. We'll pick the profile, and I'll also pick the guide curves from the tree. Okay, so that is the start of my new form. I have a spline. It's going to be used to define the top face, and I'm going to extrude a surface with this spline. This is using our hybrid modeling techniques. Make sure that it fully intersects my form. And now in the Surfaces tab, we have this command, Cut with Surface, and it removes the unwanted surface and the unwanted material from our model. Watch the arrow. You can reverse it. Green check. I'm happy with that. So I could have created that cut with a straight extruded surface, but I'm going to re a straight extruded cut, but I'm going to reuse that surface later. All right, and here is the start of my form. It looks pretty good. All right, some highlights if you're taking notes. Splines, keep it simple. Add points to the hills and the valleys. It's going to re it's going to result in a smoother surface, and you're going to actually have some better performance. SOLIDWORKS is not trying to solve for a bunch of points. You can add relations to your spline handles and your spline points, and it's OK to leave your splines underdefined. For your sweeps, you want to create your path and your guide curves first. That way, you can relate the profile back to the path and the guide curves. You use the Pierce relationship between a point and a curve. Right. And we saw we used some hybrid modeling techniques. We used the surface as a design aid. And we used the cut with surface command on the surfaces tab. And this cut with surface command works with planes as well. All right, our next step will be separating the form into individual bodies. We're going to use the split tool and the intersect tool to do this. The split and the intersect tools are great ways to add bodies without having to add or remove material. And this will result in a multi-body part with each body listed in the solid bodies folder. All right, so let's see that. So a horizontal line is the delineation between the cover and the main housing. So I'm going to use this horizontal line with the split tool. And it's going to result in a main body and a cover. So with the split tool, we select which bodies we want to keep. 
And also within the split tool, we have an option here to save out these individual bodies as parts. I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to do that a little bit later. So I'll green check to accept this. So now I have a solid bodies folder. I can expand it. Inside it shows me each of my bodies. I can select each one. I can control the visibility from the solid bodies folder. I can choose to hide the body or right click on it and I can isolate the body which means view only. So I'm going to work on the cover right now. So I isolated him. And I see that we have some major undercuts in this, in this cover. So this can't be manufactured in one piece. So I'll separate it out into two pieces, reusing that cut extrude to create an offset surface. Okay, so now with the intersect tool, I can select surface bodies, solid bodies, or planes. And SOLIDWORKS is going to calculate all of the intersecting regions between them. All right. In the intersect tool, we have to select the bodies to exclude. So I'm not going to select anything. I'm going to accept it. Now I have my new cap body. Here's the cover body and my main housing. All right, so let's work on the main housing. I'll isolate him. And again, I'll use the intersect tool. And this time I'll use it with, let me actually my isolate. I'm going to use the intersect tool. This time I'll use it with the front plane with that body, the intersect. Now I have a front and a rear housing. I'm not going to exclude anything. Green check. Okay, so we have our four bodies separated out, and it's showing here in the solid bodies folder. This looks good. Some highlights, the split tool and the intersect tool are great ways to create additional bodies without having to add or remove material. The split tool, we select the bodies we want to keep. The intersect tool, we select the bodies we want to exclude. The solid bodies folder lists the bodies in our multi-body part and we can control their visibility. We can hide or isolate the bodies from the solid bodies folder. All right, now we're going to further develop the design and add some features. So we're going to use our regular old SOLIDWORKS features as well as create and use surfaces to add design details. And this again is using our hybrid modeling techniques. We'll specify which bodies to apply a feature to using the feature scope. And we'll create a new body within the model and that will be our keypad. And then at the end we'll verify the design. All right, so the first feature we're going to add is a fillet, one millimeter, to the top edge. I'm going to continue working on the cover, so I, I'll, I'll isolate him. I can right-click on the body in, in the um, body section of our right-click menu, select isolate as well. And we'll just create a two millimeter shell, removing the top and bottom surfaces. Now adding a adding features to a multi-body part is no different than adding features to a single body part. You're just applying features to bodies. All right now we can see that our cover can be molded. Over in our property manager, over in our um, feature tree, I can see that I have a body now named shell and I have a body named Fillet. So the names of the bodies as we are working on them takes the name of the last feature applied to it. So as we're developing our design and adding features, the names of these bodies will be continually changing. Okay, so 
I'm going to go ahead and add the shells to the front and the back housing. So I'll hide my cover. And we'll create a two millimeter shell here. Thank you. And again, the front housing, two millimeter shell. Now I did forget to add a feature to the top face, something that will span both the front and the back housings. So not only do we have all of the SOLIDWORKS features available to us in a multi-body part, we have all of the SOLIDWORKS commands available to us in a multi-body part. So I'm going to roll back the model to before the intersect. And I'll just quickly create an extrusion here. Maybe it's holding some, some mysterious component in our assembly. All right, now when I roll forward, there's the intersect axe on that guy, and he also gets shelled. Right, looks good. So let's now continue working on the front housing. I'll hide the rear housing. And we'll create uh, the control panel. So I already have a sketch of the control panel created. And the, we'll reuse the ellipse in this sketch to create a projected curve on the front face. Didn't catch. Let me just grab this guy. There we go. All right, so that is the outer edge of my control panel. The industrial design shows the control panel of a recessed dome. So to create the recessed dome, I'm going to use a boundary surface. So we need two additional sketches, basically the U and the V of our boundary surface. So this U sketch. It's going to be a three-point arc. And just like we did with the profile and the guide curve, I'm going to create a Pierce relationship between the endpoints of my arc and my projected curve. Now I'm assured that my endpoints are always going to ride along that curve. Looks good. I'll accept that. I'm going to do it again. This time it's the V curve of our sketch. Again, same methodology. I'll use a three point arc. And I'll add my Pierce relationships. And I'm going to add one more that is the midpoint of this arc with my U sketch, and I'll make that pierce. Now my U and my V and my projected curve are all aligned to each other. Can create my boundary surface now, selecting both the U and the V. Using the hybrid modeling techniques again, Back to that cut with surface command, select the boundary surface. Notice the arrow. It's in the right direction. I'll accept it. All right, so I'll hide the boundary surface. And I can see that my cut is too deep and I have a hole in the model. That's not good. So like I said, we have all of our SOLIDWORKS commands available to us. So I can pick up on the shell, and I'll reorder this guy to after the cut with surface. Looking better. Let me check with a cross section. And yes, we do have a nominal wall. Excellent. Now continuing with our control panel, we'll create the cutouts for the keys. Again, we're going to use the favorite contour select tool. I'll select our three sketches. And now when I extrude this cut, 
He's going to be through all. I want this cut to only apply to my front housing. All right. So in order to restrict that cut to the front housing, we use the feature scope. Right now, I have auto select turned on. SolidWorks is making a decision which bodies to apply this cut to. So I don't want that. I want to tell SolidWorks which bodies to apply the cut. So I'm going to clear feature scope, only select the front housing, and I'll accept that. Now I am sure that that cut only will affect the front housing. All right, let's go ahead and add the keypad. That is the new body in our part. And I will again reuse that control panel sketch. The outside edge of my keypad will be the ellipse. And now when I create the extrude, my keypad does not need to start at the parting surface. So I'll use the offset option, start him on the inside. And now I'm not sure if this new body will inter intersect with my front housing. So to ensure that it becomes its own body, I will clear the merge result. Accept it. And now in my solid bodies folder, here is the new body for my keypad. And my front housing looking good. All right, now I'm going to add the keys. Again, reusing that sketch, offset entities, and we'll create an offset for the keys so that it is not line to line with the cutouts. And I have to do this three times. All right, I'll create the protrusion. And again, I'm going to reuse my data. My offset, my uh, end condition will be offset from the surface. That will be the control panel surface. And make sure the offset's going in the right direction. And we'll give it the right value. To make sure that my keys are only added to the keypad body, I'm going to clear the auto select and only select the keypad body to add the keys to. Here's my keys, and here's my front housing. Great. All right, next, we have one more feature to add for that mysterious uh, component in our assembly. I'm going to add a cutout. This cutout is going to span both the front and the back housings. So my sketch will span both the front and the back housing. And I'll, I'll give it the correct dimensions according to the spec of our mysterious component. And now when I create my cut, I'm going to make sure that this guy only affects the front and the back housing. So I will make sure that only those two bodies are selected. So you can select one body or multiple bodies to apply a feature to. Green check. Okay. So what we're doing here really is we are simulating an assembly. Right? All of our bodies represent an individual component. Now, if I were working in, a, in an assembly, this would be a good time to run an interference detection. In 2018 or older versions of SOLIDWORKS, we would have to assemble this part into a dummy assembly in order to check for interferences. In 2019, SOLIDWORKS introduced interference detection in part mode for our multi-body parts. It's in the same place. It's in the Evaluate tab, Interference Detection, it's the same interface that we know and love. We hit the Calculate button. And it's going to highlight the interferences between our bodies. We can expand each interference and show the culprits. So it seems that our cover interferes with the front and the back housing. So let's go ahead and fix that. I'll isolate my cover. And I'll just quickly create a cut on this bottom surface. And 
And now when I extrude the cut, I want to be careful. He's through all. I want to make sure that this guy does not affect my cap. So I'll clear auto select and only affect the cover. Great. Okay, so we're good. We've added all our features and we verified the design. So now for the sake of the demo, I'm going to change our master model's appearance. And since I'm actually wearing pink, I'm going to change the color to pink. That way it's easily identified as I pop in and out of, of our master model window. All right, so some highlights for adding features. All of our SOLIDWORKS features and commands are available on a multi-body part. We have the feature scope. We want to clear the feature scope so that you apply the feature to your specified bodies. Clearing the, mirror, the uh, merge result checkbox, that ensures that we're going to be creating a new body. And then we have interference detection available to us in part mode for your multi-body parts. And this requires SOLIDWORKS 2019 or newer. So we're at a good point now to save out our individual components. SOLIDWORKS provides several commands to save one or more solid bodies as part files. And we saw that with the split tool earlier. I'm going to show you two additional ways to create parts from the individual bodies, and then we'll create an assembly. Now, you would only choose one of these methods. You would not do both. You're going to end up with the same result. So which method you choose depends on the benefits of the functionality. The first way we're going to look at is the insert part. This is a pull method. We're going to create an empty part, and then we'll pull in the master model. And then we can also, in that process, we can select other entities, reference geometry, sketches, and such, to transfer as well. In insert part, there is no feature created in the master model tree indicating the child parts exist. So the names for our child parts should refer back to the master model it came from. All right, so let's go ahead and see insert part. So I'll create a new part. In the insert menu, select part. I can have my, my, in my open documents, I see my master model name device, or I can browse to it. Here in the property, here in my um, command, I have the option to transfer other entities, surface bodies, planes, axes, any kind of sketches, so that we can reuse data. I also have an option to break the link to, this, to the original part. Well, I don't want to do that. I want to keep the link to my master model because I want to make changes to the master model, and I want this part to update. So I'll green check to locate the part at the origin. Now notice I have all of my five bodies in this one part. I don't want that. I just want the front housing. So we're going to use the command delete keep body. We have the option to select the bodies we want to delete, or we have the options to select the bodies we want to keep, whichever has the fewer clicks. So I'm going to keep bodies, and I'm just going to select the front housing. I can also select other bodies as well, and this will result in a multi-body part, but for today, we're just going to have the front housing. Green check. Now, this is our front housing part. It's just like any other SOLIDWORKS part. I can continue to add features to this model. It, those features do not need to be added in the master model. So we can add features here in this part mode. Notice the first feature in our tree. We have the master model name and then an external reference indicator, the dash with the greater than sign. If there's a question mark after the indicator, that means our external reference is out of context. right? It's not in memory. To put it back in context, we right click on that first feature, 
select edit in context and that will open the master model. So since I'm here, I'm going to look at the bottom of my master model tree and I don't see any feature here that says insert part. There's no indication that that child part exists. Right? So we need to name our parts appropriately. So I'll rename this guy as device front and I'm going to put an IP insert part at the end so that we know what the methodology uh, was used to create this. All right, let's do it again. Trial new. Create a new part. And this time we're going to we're going to insert our part. I'm not going to accept anything. I will locate him at the origin and this time I'm going to just have the rear housing. So you can also right click on the body in your solid bodies folder say delete keep body green check and I'll name this device rear insert part. All right, let's go ahead and create an assembly. My first component of the assembly will be the rear housing. So I'll give a green check to orient this guy at the origin. Now when we go to insert components, I'll select the front housing. Now because the these parts were created based off the same master model, based off that same origin. I can just give a green check, locating it, fixing it to the origin, and it will assemble perfectly in place. So this is going to save you tons of time and effort in creating mates and then managing those mates. I'm going to save this now. I'll call it insert part assembly. for comparison later. We could continue in adding the cover and the cap, but I think you get the gist. Now there's one more thing I do want to show you that's in the master model. If I go to my solid bodies folder. If I right click on one of the bodies, here's the keypad, and there's a command here called insert into new part. This is not the same command as insert part. Insert into new part is going to push this body into a new part. So I'll give it a new name, smart name again, device, this is the keypad, insert new part. And it goes out and it creates that new part for me. I did not get the option to transfer any additional features or break that link. Right, so I just wanted to point that out. Now see, since I have this part created, let's go ahead and assemble it into the insert part assembly. And all I need to do is green check and it assembles in place. Okay, so that was method one, insert part. We saved out our parts as individual components and we gave them intelligent names and we have our assembly of those individual components. Now let's look at method two. This is the save bodies command. And again, you're only going to be using one of these methods depending on the benefits that the command provides. So save bodies is a push method. It pushes the bodies from the master model into the individual parts. So you push one body into one part. This method does create a time-based feature in your master model's feature tree. So any additional features to the master model that occur after the save bodies feature will not propagate to the child parts. So we must roll back the model and add features. And you know what? I'm absolutely getting ahead of myself here. So let's first see uh, creating those parts using save bodies. All right, so I'll go back to my master model. 
And before I go into the Save Bodies command, I'm going to rename all of the bodies in my Solid Bodies folder. And I'm just hitting F2 to rename it. I'm doing this so that it's pretty much a time saver. I can use the Auto Assign Name option in the Save Bodies command. This guy is the front. Now, when you manually rename the bodies, it no longer takes on the name of the last feature applied to it. Last one. The exception to that rule is when you use a command that acts on the body, like a combine, the new bodies will take on the name of the last feature applied to it. Okay, so let's push these bodies out into into the individual parts. So I'm going to right click on the solid bodies folder, say save bodies. Here's our option to auto assign the names. Now all of our new parts will be will have the same name as our body names. And right here in the save bodies feature or in the save bodies command, I can create an assembly. So I'll give it the same name, save bodies assembly for comparison. And I'll give a green check. Now SOLIDWORKS is doing a lot of things for us right now. It's going out and it's creating those components on the fly. And it's also building the Save Bodies assembly for us. So I'm still here in my master model. If I go down to the bottom of my tree, here's the Save Bodies command. Here's that time-based feature. All right, let's take a look at the Save Bodies assembly. Here's my cap part. Here's my keypad part. Here's the front part, the rear, and the cover. Let me open the front part. Again, this is just like any other SOLIDWORKS part. We can continue adding features here. I look at that first, that first feature. It again has the master model name and the external reference. It acts the same. I can right click on it, say edit in context, and that will open the master model. All right, so that was the save bodies command. We have all of our bodies created, all of our parts created, and we have our assembly created. That was method two. So when we use the insert part command, we pull the master model into our part. Then we use the delete key bodies command to select which body or bodies to retain in that part. There's no feature in the master model's feature tree, so we have to name our new parts smartly. You can select entities to be transferred to the child parts, and you see that I'm actually screaming this. It's capitalized and in red because I think this is a huge benefit of using the insert part command. As opposed to the save bodies command, that is a push method. It pushes one body into one part. It creates the Save Bodies feature in the Master Models feature tree. However, no additional features are transferred, only the body. And it creates all of the parts and builds the assembly for us on the fly. And so for me, that is a huge time saver, screamed in red. Now, in both methods, you can right click on the external reference, say Edit in Context, and that will open our Master Model. All right, so now we're going to make some changes. And I said at the beginning that the beauty of the master model technique is that we create this parent-child relationship between the master and the children. And any changes to the master will propagate to those child parts. And this will speed up our design process. So we're going to make a change to the overall form. Then we're going to roll back the model to before the save bodies feature and add some fastening features. And then we'll roll forward and review all of our components. All right, so let's jump back into SOLIDWORKS. And we'll go to the master model. 
And as I see these designs, I see that my neck is pretty thin, it's kind of spindly in here. So I first want to change the form and beefen that up. So I'm going to edit that right side spline, our guide curve. I'm just going to gently pull out on these spline points. All right, that will add some more material. And it will beefen that area up. Come on. Yeah, I know you can do it. There we go. All right, that's good. I'll accept that. Oh, no. What's that? The shell. Well, let's go ahead and close this. And we will, let's see, what can we do? Let's go ahead and edit that spline again. This is the benefit of a live demo. Let's see if it can create it. Maybe I gave it too much of the thickness. Come on. Oh, now it's happy, but boy, that looks terrible. You know what? I'm going to keep it just so that we can see the changes. All right. Okay, so we're going to make some more changes. I'm going to roll back my model before the save bodies command. And we're going to add a mounting boss to the rear housing. So I'm going to isolate my rear housing. If there's any industrial designers in the, in the crowd, I apologize for this. <laughs> All right, so the first thing we're going to add is a fastening feature. It's located in the insert menu, fastening feature, mounting boss. Okay, so what's great about the mounting boss and these fastening features, it's like a wizard over here in your property manager. You just basically fill out the form. All right, so we're going to uh, select a face to add the mounting boss. And I see a preview of our mounting boss. I'm going to go ahead and give it an orientation. That will be the front plane. And we have a selection between a hardware boss or a pin boss. We're going to have the hardware boss. And the height of our mounting boss will be the parting surface. And I can see that our fins are going to have an issue. But let's continue. So we have our little illustration here depicting each parameter or dimension in our mounting boss. This is very helpful. You can also hover over these boxes and you get a tool tip. So this is the diameter of our mounting boss. That's seven. That's the diameter of the step. We'll change that to five. The height of the step will be, say, 1.25. Here's the draft. Two is fine. This is the diameter of the inside of the hole, two and a half. That's the diameter of the counter bore, we'll say four and a half. That's the depth, one and a half, that's fine in the draft angle, one. We'll change that to one and a half. That looks good. All right, so now you can see our mounting boss has turned red. It's an indication it can't be solved. I can see that my fins are all the way up through my step. So let's work on the fins now. I'm going to orient the fins towards the top plane, and then we'll change the Let's look at the, the width of the fins is fine. Let's change the height. Let's change that to five. There we go. That was the issue. The fins was not happy. Now my, my mounting boss updates perfectly. And here's the draft angle and some values for my chamfer. I'm happy with that. I'll accept it. Looks pretty good. But I see that my mounting boss is not centered in my part. So I'm going to edit the mounting box, the boss's sketch. All right, when we're dealing with a 3D sketch, we deal with planes. We don't deal with edges. So I'll create a relationship between the point and the right plane, an on-plane relation. Now I'm assured that my mounting boss will be centered. Okay. Same thing goes for making your dimensions. You want to select a plane for this distance dimension. 
if I had selected an edge, that dimension could have been skewed and I wouldn't get a true value. Looks good. Green check. I'll accept it. All right, so there's our mounting boss. Looks pretty good. All right, I'm going to add another mounting boss. This time it's to the front housing. All right, so to, in order for me to see inside and get at the existing geometry, I'm actually going to work in cross section. Okay, so again, insert fastening feature, mounting boss. Position will be on the inside of the front face. I'm going to select the orientation. I'm going to select the uh, existing edge this mounting boss to align to. And now for my orientation, again, select the front plane and make sure it goes in the right direction. Okay, so this guy is now going to be the hardware boss, but it is going to be the threaded side, so it will receive the screw. And for the height, I'll select a face on the existing mounting boss so that they nest nicely. Now all of the parameters somewhat match up to our existing mounting boss. That's the, dia the diameter, the draft angle. Here's the diameter of the step. So I'm going to open that up a little bit, a little clearance. Here's the diameter of the inside hole. I'm happy, the height of the step. Here is the depth of our blind hole. So we can see that this blind hole cuts right through the model. I don't want that, so I'm going to change that maybe to five. That's too much. I have too much of a piece of plastic here. Let's make that maybe 6.5. Yeah, you know, maybe six. Yeah, that's good. Not a thin wall and not a huge slug of plastic. All right, again, the fins. Let's orient the fins towards the top. And the preview looks good. I'm happy with that. I'll accept that. And it's going to create our nested mounting boss perfectly. Very easy. All right, the next thing we're going to create is a lip and a groove feature. Again, it's in the insert fastening features, lip and groove. It's just like the mounting boss. It has a bunch of parameters that we fill in. All right, so the first thing it's asking for is the body that contains the groove, the body that contains the lip, and obviously a, um, a orientation plane. So the groove selection box is highlighted. It automatically hides that front housing, so I have easy selection. So the groove's placement plane is going to be on the surface, the parting surface, and now I'll select the edges to remove material. Looks good. Now I'll jump into the lip selection box and it highlights the rear housing, same placement plane, the parting surface, and now edges to add material. And further down in my property manager, here we have all of our, our parameters with our little illustration. So we have the groove width and the spacing in between, the draft angle, the upper gap. Here's the lip height and the lip width. Here is the, uh, the gap on the outside of our part. This is the relief line. So this all looks good. I'm going to green check. All right, looking good. Here's our relief line. And we've added all of our new features to the model. So let's look at the feature tree. Again, I'm at the end of the tree. There's no insert part feature, but the insert part updates the components at the bottom of the feature tree. So let's go now and look at the insert part assembly. Still. Still not so bulbous, right? I'll update the assembly. There I have my new form. 
I'll go ahead and open the insert part uh, for front. Here's my lip. There's my mounting boss added. Let's go ahead and look at the rear. There's the groove, and there's the mounting boss added. Looks good. All right, let's go back to our master model. And we'll check out the save bodies assembly. Now I have to roll forward after the save bodies feature, and that propagates the changes to those save bodies component. Okay, so now I'll go to my save bodies assembly. Still the old form. I'll update it. All right, we got our new form. And if I look at the rear housing, It updates with my mounting boss and my groove, and I'll look at the front housing. And it's updated with my lip and my mounting boss here as well. All right, so all of our changes have been propagated to both assemblies, and all of their components have been updated perfectly. All right, so when we're making changes, you can use the insert part command, right? And any changes or additions are gonna be propagated at the end of the feature tree. So you can make a change at any time. However, when you use the save bodies, you must roll back before the save bodies feature to make any additions and then roll forward to propagate the change. All right, we saw those fastening features. They are awesome. They wrap up multiple features into one command. I mean, those two mounting bosses, they were something like 12 features created from a wizard. And notice we didn't create one sketch, right? That's pretty efficient. It's in the insert menu, fastening feature. So the master model technique has some real benefits. It can speed up the design process. You can easily create the multiple parts that share portions of the same overall form. There's a time savings when creating assemblies. So the assembly is created automatically when you use the save bodies command. It's on the fly and the components are fixed to the origin. The assembly is created as a second step when using the insert part command, but each component can be placed with a green check, fixing them to the origin. And this is gonna save you time adding and managing all of those mates. And then there's a huge time savings in making changes. Changes are made once to one model, to the master model, all right? The changes will propagate to the child parts. And again, because of that parent-child relationship between the master model and the child components, it's best to use this master model technique on your one-of-a-kind type models. And again, it's not suited for those standard parts library. All right, so there we have it. That was the master modeling technique sprinkled in with some hybrid modeling techniques. If you want more information about master modeling, you can enroll in the advanced part class, or you can take the surface modeling class. Both offer lessons in master modeling techniques. MySolidWorks.com has master modeling lessons in the surfacing e-course. And for those fastening features, I mean, quite honestly, you can just Google it. That's what's great about the SolidWorks community. They are very generous with information. There are many blogs and videos available. All right, so I leave you with some action items to try it. Try it on your next unique design. This methodology is available to everyone. It's in SOLIDWORKS standard. So try adding those adding surfaces to your arsenal of tools, right? It's, as a design aid, it's gonna open up an array of new possibilities and try adding those fastening features. And they're not just for injection molding. I mean, you can machine a mounting boss or you can machine a lip and groove. All right, 
So we're coming up on the hour. I thank you very much for joining me today.